I'm happy to be joined today by Dr. Ron Carson, who is a Boeing Technical Fellow, retired from Boeing. Ron, if you wouldn't mind giving us a brief introduction on yourself and a little bit of your background and the types of systems you've worked with over the, the last few years, uh, that would be great. Appreciate your time today. Well, thanks for having me, Brian. Um, so I worked at Boeing for 27 years. I rose to the level of Technical Fellow, retired working on enterprise level systems engineering process definition, which included primarily requirements analysis, um, system engineering measurement, uh, authored a number of papers, published mostly in the uh, INCOSI International Symposia proceedings. I'm also a fellow of the INCOSI and also a designated expert systems engineering professional, which is a NCOSI certification. So I am very interested in getting the requirements right. Um, so that starts with, are they going to be able to satisfy what the needs are? And then how do we ensure that they're verifiable so that we can know whether they're satisfied? So we get into the validation question and I've written a number of papers on this as well. Uh, some of which are available on the uh, my YouTube channel, Ron on Requirements. And I also have a LinkedIn profile where I publish articles, um, not just on system engineering processes, but on other subjects like global warming. And I published an article on uh, COVID-19 self-protection and how long you can be in a room before you might get infected. So those are some okay. things I dabble in uh, now. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that background uh, for everyone watching. So today, the topic that we wanted to jump into is on the two types of functional decomposition. I had originally come across an article that Ron had written a few months back that was shared with me by Tim Wilkins, who I've been working with on a, an upcoming book. And I thought it was interesting because I don't think a lot of people understand that there, in fact, is two types of functional decomposition when it comes to analysis and, and how you can break down functions that may be at a system level or a subsystem level. And I really wanted to delve into that with Ron because he, he wrote this article that I think explains it very elegantly. So, Ron, if you wouldn't mind, give, give us a rundown on how you would explain the two types of functional decomposition. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to share the um, PowerPoint that I mentioned earlier. Absolutely. And um, so this, this actually started from a discussion I had with a colleague at Boeing in the early 2000s. We were talking about functional decomposition and the standard way it's done. Um, we were using this MIL standard 499 model at the time, requirements analysis, functional analysis, synthesis. And he pointed out, um, and it was actually Murray Cantor, who was the chief scientist at Rational, which was uh, merged into IBM a few years later, that when systems engineers decompose requirements and functions, they're presuming a logical architecture but not being explicit about it. Right. So I wrote the article, uh, published it within Boeing, and then eventually on LinkedIn. You can find it under a series of articles um, correcting misperceptions of systems engineering. The two types of decomposition, first of all, there's the elaboration of functions at a single architectural level to ensure observability at the system boundary. And observability at the system boundary is the key uh, rule or guideline. Otherwise, you can't verify the eventual requirement. If you can't observe the function, then you're not going to be able to verify the requirement associated with that function. So we often have rather high level descriptions of functionality, as in this example, drive vehicle for an automobile. But that's not really observable because we don't really know what that means. So we will typically decompose such a function into, in this case, three 
uh, functions, accelerate, turn, and decelerate, all of which, or each of which is observable at the system boundary. If you look at the vehicle from the outside, you can determine that it is either accelerating or turning or decelerating or doing some combination of those. So that's the first type of decomposition. It happens at a single architectural level, and it is necessary to be able to derive functions associated with specific interfaces and ensure that the function is observable at that level. So that's the first type. The second type is where we typically get into more trouble, and this was the basis for Murray Cantor's uh, challenge and complaint about systems engineering de functional decomposition, is that we often presume a logical architecture as the basis for making the decomposition without being explicit about it. Right. So rather than doing functional analysis <clears throat> ahead of defining the logical architecture, we actually need to define the logical architecture in order to identify where the interfaces are going to be. So right. functional decomposition has to happen after we propose a trial architecture of what the elements are at the next lower level. For example, in this diagram, I have a rather conventional uh, vehicle architecture uh, with a drivetrain and steering and braking. But you could have a, and, and that leads to a, a mapping and a decomposition of the parent functions. Accelerate is almost wholly allocated to drivetrain. Right. But if you had, for example, a vehicle that was uh, not just a, a, a simple drivetrain and separate steering system, but actually had electric wheels, electric motors at each of the four wheels, it could be steered by differential drive of those motors, in which case accelerate and turn are both allocated to the set of four electric motors at the wheels and some control system. Right. In other words, you've got a more highly integrated next lower level architecture, but the functions associated with each of those next lower level elements are quite different. The electric right. wheel motors provide torque um, to the wheels, but the inputs are from the power system under control of some controlling system. And those are different kinds of interfaces compared with the ones you see here, where the drivetrain effectively has almost no interface to steering, except as they come together at the wheels, similarly for the braking. So our decomposition of functionality is dependent right. on the logical architecture. And this is why we have trial architectures to be able to figure out what are the impacts on defining interfaces. And once we select a trial architecture, then we detail out those interfaces as part of architecture and design definition, those two technical processes. And we realize what the interfaces are explicitly based on the need to have observable functions. So this is why I say logical architecture has to precede the functional architecture, and we should always have a trial, a set of trial architectures, not just a single one. And each of those trial logical architectures will yield different functional decompositions. So that's the, the short uh, pitch on this problem of uh, two different kinds of decomposition. I, I think that makes perfect sense, and I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with currently because they they begin going down the path of decomposing functions, and then they get into this situation where they begin decomposing functions to no end, and mm -hmm. not even they're not even thinking about what level of the architecture are we at even. So it's basically they'll they'll start going down the rabbit hole of decompose, 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 but not yeah. thinking about what you know what part of a system could even do this function and as you said is it observable at that level of the architecture so with that I, I, a question that i have for you is what should a 
what should an engineer be thinking about when he's looking at a function and and saying should i decompose this or is it okay with what it says at this very moment is there a, some type of a, a thought process that, that that engineer should be thinking through to answer the question of do i take this another step further do i go one level deeper is it okay right now and what should we do with that so the, the first question is is this function observable at the boundary of the system of interest Mm -hmm. when, and that bespeaks first i have to know what is the boundary of my system of interest what's inside and what versus what's outside right. if the function isn't observable at the boundary then there's two possibilities either it's not really being performed by that system of interest or it's not observable in, and it, therefore it needs to be decomposed into elements that are observable there are certain um common functions one of my most least favorite of course is the receive function that a okay. system has to receive some input well that's inherently not observable hmm. uh, and, and typically what that really means is when a system of interest receives some input it does something so this is not just decomposition, this is a transformation and a correction. So mm -hmm. the first question is, is this function observable? And if it's not, then the engineer has to figure out how to make the intent of that function observable by the system of interest. It may be, right. as in the case of the receive, uh, just an input. And then mm -hmm. the engineer has to say, well, upon receipt of whatever it is it's receiving what am i expecting the system of interest to do right. with that is it going to display it is it going to send it on is it going to transform it into some other kind of an output um, but making sure that whatever function is identified is also observable at the boundary of that system of interest so okay. that's the first thing having then validated that we have observable functions at the system of interest, then we propose logical architectures for the structure of that system of interest, each of which, each of those elements now becomes its own system of interest at the next lower level. Okay. And I go through the same exercise. So if I have a need for, or a function that I derived at the system of interest to send out a message, to some other entity um, upon receipt of some particular input, well, then I need to have elements of the system of interest, the subordinate logical architecture that allow me to send out that, send out that message. So maybe there's a computer involved, maybe there's more than one computer involved. If there's more than one computer, then I'm going to need some sort of a interface, could be a network. And now I'm having to consider, well, what is the logical architecture that is going to allow me to send out this necessary message right. upon receipt of this particular input? And that's the, so that's the thought process you go through. And then in between, uh, the elements uh, of the logical architecture, there's an interface, and one has to, again, validate that whatever is going between them is observable by the sending mm -hmm. unit and becomes an input to the receiving unit that ultimately sends out the system level function. So that's a quick summary of that. I want to make sure I have clear in my mind the thought process that you go through as as that occurs. So let's say you've you've developed this trial logical architecture and at that point you say you then ask the question how do we decompose the function that we had at the higher level now that we have this logical architecture in place that's where you're going with this correct? Yeah. So you are going to have to figure out based on the logical architecture is the parent function output from a single element of the logical architecture already in other words the function is wholly allocated to one subordinate element in which case it doesn't need further decomposition it just needs assignment in other words 
a single element of the logical architecture both receives and outputs the input to the parent system level function and outputs the system level output, in which case there's no further decomposition needed, it's just assigned. Okay. So that's, that's simple. So that's the question is, are both the input and the output assigned to a single logical element of, this, of the logical architecture? Right. The, same, the same subordinate element both receives and outputs um, the functionality associated with that system level function. If that's true, there's no decomposition. It's just what we call an um, in total assignment or allocation mm -hmm. to that el that next lower level of the logical architecture. This often happens, for example, um, for well certain kinds of system level functions about sensing and. Uh, message trafficking and so forth, it may be that there's a single logical element in the architecture that does all of that function. If it's not true that the whole function can be handled by a single logical element, then one has to figure out, well, based on this logical architecture, what elements of this system level function are performed by each element of the logical architecture. This is design activity. It's not prescriptive. It's a creative activity and different engineers will come up with different solutions. And the whole point of having trial architectures is so that one can trade off the effectiveness of different solutions based on system level measures like cost and weight and performance and so forth, mm -hmm. make decisions about the, the best logical architecture based on some of these functional decompositions. So there's no strict correct answer for mm -hmm. the proper de logical architecture. It's a design activity. And like right. I said, different engineers will come up with different solutions. And the point is to evaluate them and decide which one is best with respect to the measures of effectiveness that have been defined up front. Right. Absolutely. With that, I, if it's all right, I'd like to jump into the, the a few diagrams that I modeled from your article. And then I know you have some thoughts on that. So I'd like to I'd like for everyone to hear what your thoughts are on this as well. Uh, and in the article that Ron had written, he he gives an example of an ATM machine, and there's a very high level use case such as deliver cash to user. And with that, there were a few functions such as deliver cash involved, and then there were functions that could be observed at that system level, such as authenticate user, request account information, request amount, or offer receipt. And then breaking down that authenticate user, there is also display ATM card requests, send user information, and display user authentication status. So a few questions that I have for you, Ron, are in, in the case of some of these functions, such as display the ATM card request, in your opinion, is that uh, also a function that is observable at the system boundary? Presumably, I mean, I would start with uh, making sure I have the context diagram in place, but there has to be some means for the user to receive input from the ATM. And a, a display is a common um, interface between an automated teller machine and a user, so the user knows what the ATM is asking for. So certainly display is an observable function um, it also gives a hint about how you might be architecting the, the next lower level that you might need right. a display unit, yeah, or right, at least right. something that performs display, whether it's an isolated unit or not. Similarly, send user information suggests that there's some interaction of the ATM with some outside entity in that the ATM doesn't have everything it needs to be able to perform the authenticate user function. Like, right. is this a valid card or has it been 
Um, you know, has it been disabled because of theft? Um, yeah. Is this a valid user? Do they have accounts? How much is in each account? You typically right. wouldn't store all that information at every ATM. Right. Rather, you would have the ATM interact with a banking system to get that information as needed. So sending user information would be a valid observable function that could be seen on whatever the uh, connection is from the ATM to the bank, whether it's internet right. or a phone system or some proprietary mm -hmm. interface. Right. Okay, that, that makes perfect sense. So moving down to uh, a few other parts that I, I modeled in this, I, I know you have some thoughts on this, so I, I wanna get your feedback here. What I did was I, I took this example and said, all right, we know that we would like to potentially be able to read the card. So we would like to have a card reader. And I, I came to that conclusion by breaking down this authenticate user into what I thought could be actual activities of the authenticate user, but they would be dependent upon the actual logical architecture, such as reading the card, verifying the pin, possibly reading a fingerprint, possibly reading a scan retina or scanning a retina or reading a Bluetooth mobile device. So I, I'd like to for everyone to hear your feedback on this because I thought it was interesting how you explained to me that this is not quite right. Right. There's, so there's a couple of issues. First, um, the decomposition of the automated teller machine block is probably not going to be able to execute all of the functions uh, listed above for displaying the ATM card request unless the computer also includes the display function. So this is where uh, context diagrams and interface definition becomes really important. Um, so maybe the decomposition of ATM is incomplete and maybe there need to be some other things. Um, it says in the comment note there, use requirements to guide logical architecture decisions. Uh, that I don't agree with that. I think you use the functions to guide the logical architecture decisions. The functions, uh, the requirements are derived from the functions at all levels. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see that requirements are derived from functions, not the other way around. So therefore, we derive the logical architecture decisions from the functions themselves at the, at the system of interest. The uh, bigger problems are down in the green box. There are possible sub functions. And what I commented to Brian earlier was that none of those functions is observable at the boundary of anything. So how would you know, for example, a card was read? How would you know that a pin was verified? How would you know that a fingerprint or a Bluetooth mobile device was read? And how would you know that a retina was scanned? Well, the obvious answer is because the system of interest or some element of the system of interest did something that was observable at its boundaries. So in fact, each of these things is, um, at best an input to some activity so a card reader and it's in a card and its information is presented to a card reader or a human eyeball is presented to a retinal scanner and then those devices those logical elements do something that is either output at the system of interest or it's output to another logical element at the same uh, of, uh, at the same lower level of the architecture. So th when we're decomposing functions, yes, we know it has to do those things. And that's the first response I always get, but it has to read it. Well, yes, but would you know that it read it? Not unless it did something that either said, yes, I read it successfully, or, uh, I read it, I could not read it successfully, or I read it, but this user is not valid because I checked with the bank. Um, right. So there's several steps that might be involved in this. Uh, also, there are three different, three actually five different 
uh, types of functions here that might need unique interfaces, each one of them. Mm -hmm. right. um, a card reader, a fingerprint scanner, a retinal scanner, uh, a Bluetooth connection, and um, not sure exactly how the verify pin is. Um, that might be an interaction with the, the bank via the internet or something. So there may be multiple options here, um, but if these are valid activities, then these should be explicit on the context diagram. In other words, there should be an explicit interface identified at the system of interest that the, the interface to the user is not just a card and a display, but it's going to be a fingerprint scanner, which means there has to be some definition of how the fingerprint interface is defined or a retinal scanner, which means there has to be some definition about the retinal scanner interface. In other words, how high, where is it located? Uh, what are the characteristics of the eyeball and so forth that are going to allow this to be valid? And you might say, well, we don't know all those up front. Okay, right. you may not know all those up front, which means you have some massive uh, to be determines at the system right. of interest level because you're uh, operating concept is incomplete because you don't know exactly how you're going to do the validation of the mm -hmm. user or the authentication of the user. Right. So one can't select the subordinate logical elements mm -hmm. unless we know we have a complete description of the interfaces. And right. I noted this in my uh, 1996 paper Okay. The way we figure out, and this is on the YouTube, my YouTube channel, Run on Requirements, that we have to definitize the interfaces at the system of interest before we can know that we have a complete set of requirements at that mm -hmm. level. And this just indicates the problem is I don't know that I need to read a fingerprint unless mm -hmm. I'm actually implementing a fingerprint reader or vice right. versa. If I've chosen right. to do authentication with a fingerprint, then I need that function. Mm -hmm. And But the fingerprint itself becomes an input into the ATM right. that triggers the ATM to do something. Right. It's not a separate function. So a question that I have, let's say you, you had a, a stakeholder requirement that that said something such as we would like to have an ATM machine that has a retina scanner. So in that case, would you would you take that requirement and then have it influence the functions or do you take that requirement and have it influence the logical architecture and then the functions? And can you give me an idea of what you would do with that high level stakeholder requirement and how that would show up as a lower level function? So that's a form of a design requirement that says how you're going to make the system of interest to have a, was it a fingerprint scanner or retinal sure. scanner? Any, sure. Either way. Yeah. Um, so my question then would be go back, I'd go back to the uh, sponsor, the acquirer and say, I can put that in there. Do you want it to do something? Mm. Okay. In other words, oh, you, you, we can put it in there and I, you know, it, it, it'll be there. It doesn't necessarily do something, but I can prove that I satisfy your requirement by having it in the design. But I don't think that's what you intend. So help me understand why you want to have that as a design requirement, why you want to have mm -hmm. that element of the architecture. And then they'll probably tell me about, well, we want to use that to authenticate mm -hmm. the user. Okay, so how is that in your mind? How is that going to work? In other words, what's going to be the basis for the authentication? Because mm -hmm. just scanning a fingerprint doesn't authenticate any anything. It just takes a fingerprint. Right. Oh, well, you know, we're going to have the ATM interact with something that actually mm -hmm. has a record of what the user's fingerprint is. Oh, and mm -hmm. where is that located? Is that inside the ATM or is that mm -hmm. someplace else? Oh, that's that's uh, that's at the bank. Ah, so the ATM has to communicate with the bank in order to validate the fingerprint that's presented by the user. Mm -hmm. And is there a standard form in which that information about fingerprint is encoded that we should know mm -hmm. about? 
In right. other words, okay. because that says I'm going to have to generate a fingerprint mm -hmm. in that standard form that gets right. sent to the bank or mm -hmm. else, in, in which case the bank is going to perform the authentication function mm -hmm. or do you, were you intending, expecting that we would, the ATM would query the bank for the fingerprint information on file for that alleged user right. that the ATM would perform the comparison? Okay. So either way, there's some network impact in mm -hmm. transmitting uh, fingerprint information, either what was scanned or from the ATM to the bank or from the bank to the ATM, what's recorded. And then we have to decide well, which of those two entities is going to perform the validation mm -hmm. that, says, that compares those two fingerprints and makes a decision? Right. Either of those is possible, but one has to make that decision in order to be able to properly describe the functions of the ATM and mm -hmm. its associated requirements. Because if the bank, for example, is receiving the scanned fingerprint, and making the authentication decision, then the input back to the ATM is a yes, no. Yes, okay. the user's valid. Right. That's a different input and a different mm -hmm. function and a different requirement than if mm -hmm. the bank just sends back the recorded fingerprint and the ATM mm -hmm. performs the comparison. Right. This right. is why we have to know, we have to define the operating concept mm -hmm. of the system of interest in its context before right. we can detail out all the functions. Right, okay. So do you think, in your mind, does this go back to use cases at all? And and how would you uh, describe a use case such as this, where you had a, a user who wanted to walk up to an ATM and have the ATM read their retinas or scan their fingerprint? How would you take that? And, and what are your thoughts on use cases with this regard? Well, the use case is an expression of something a user wants. So the mm -hmm. user wants to withdraw their cash, as you noted, up at the very top level. Right. And we also have constraints that we don't want just anybody else being able to take cash out of somebody's account. So right. we realize that, that we need a function to authenticate a user. And now mm -hmm. we're getting into the different ways that can be done. Right. So you can call these uh, include uh, mm -hmm. use cases or something else, but you have to decide. There are many ways one could go about doing authenticate. Right. And in order to come up with a complete and verifiable set of requirements at the system of interest, one has to decide. Mm -hmm. Am I going to use a card reader? Right. And where is the validation going to happen? Mm -hmm. Am I going to use a card reader plus an, a PIN input with a keyboard? Right. In which case, I still have to decide where validation happens. Am I going to read a right. fingerprint or scan a retina or mm -hmm. use a smartphone as the input? In which case, I still have to decide where is validation happening. Right. I can't complete the definition of the use case in my mind until I know and I decide where the validation is happening. And that's mm -hmm. going to be a function of performance capabilities of the ATM and network bandwidth and how much information has to go back and forth and how fast right. I need certain things. And what about reliability? What right. about um, threats? Uh, what about um, faults that happen? You know, what happens if we lose power in the middle of this? What happens right. if right. we get hacked? What happens if the internet goes down? Yeah. All those are uh, subordinate use cases that have to uh, be involved in fleshing this out in detail. So right. you, it's fine to call it a use case. I mean, the top level use case is I want to get cash, but there's a whole right. lot of things involved in that. Right. Um, we use functional decomposition to flesh those out in some detail. Mm -hmm. And if you want to represent them in a, ser a set of use case diagrams of uh, increasing depth and detail, that's okay too. But mm -hmm. ultimately, you have to arrive at observable functions that are observable at the boundary of the system of interest. And that's why the context right. diagram is so critical for this activity.
Great. That makes sense. One last question, I guess, to to tack on to this is, let's say you've, you've done all that work that you've said, I, I know how I want to verify, I, want, I know how I want to validate this fingerprint or this retina scan. What would be the actual function that you would then have as the result that would be allocated to one of those subsystems or uh, logical architecture components, what would be an, a good example of one of those that would have been decomposed from Authenticate that you would then allocate to that lower level component? Well, as I said, um, validate is not an observable function or verify mm -hmm. is not an observable function. So the result of any validation activity is going to be either the user is allowed to proceed with transactions or they're not and if they're mm -hmm. not we might decide as system designers to uh, if it's a card reader and we believe that the card has been compromised the atm mm -hmm. could keep just keep the card say i'm mm -hmm. sorry you're not getting it back because right. this has been reported stolen if it's not the kind of situation where a card reader a card is actually inserted then there would perhaps be other actions on the part of the bank to disable any uh, external access to the account but mm -hmm. the in particular the user would not be allowed to proceed to transactions so what would be displayed to the user if validation occurred either at the bank or at the atm the user would be presented with options for mm -hmm. transactions so upon receipt of validation from the bank or upon validation um, present the following screen with transaction options if mm -hmm. not then you would see a message of the form um, this account is not valid please contact your financial institution and that mm -hmm. would terminate terminate the uh the session so those right. would be the two possible outcomes um, but it wouldn't ha say anything about you've been validated. It would just proceed. Hmm. I mean, because there's no value to the user in saying you've been validated. What the heck does that mean? It's just, you know, right. I want to withdraw cash. Okay, here are your options. Or you're not allowed, in which case here's the information you need to know. Here's a phone number to call. But you're not yeah. proceeding. And that's what you communicate to the user. Okay. Great. So I, I just want to make sure I, I fully understand how the systems engineer is to convey to the designers what what they want to occur, such as one of those lower level functions. So, so say say we're talking about that validate. How do how do I express to one of those design engineers that my intent is that when I put in a fingerprint, the system will validate that fingerprint in some fashion. Do, do they make a, a function that says validate it? Do nope. they? So no, I mean, how do you express that that's, that that's what you want to occur? So uh, I would use an MBSE tool that allows, the, that integrates and makes consistent automatically a functional flow block diagram, an activity diagram, and a sequence diagram. So matter, no matter which one I choose to use, the same information mm -hmm. is recorded. If designers like to read sequence diagrams, but I like to use functional flow block diagrams with inputs and outputs, mm -hmm. then I create a, a functional flow block diagram with the inputs and outputs, and the designer reads it as a sequence diagram. And what they see perhaps it's going to be reference to a authenticate or validate use case but what they will see is a series of input output transactions what goes into the card let's say we're using a card reader and a and a keyboard to receive a pin so mm -hmm. there will be a sequence of input of the card reader and then a display would say please enter your pin and then the keyboard would receive the pin and then the computer would receive all that input and make a decision. Uh, and then if it's valid, in other words, if the pin matches the information on the card, mm -hmm. uh, then the computer would prompt the display to display the transaction options. So it's all based on input output transformations. Mm 
Okay. So our basic, you know, seventh grade algebra, mm -hmm. y equals f of x. X is right. the input, Y is the output, F is the fun transformation function. Mm -hmm. And if we always think in terms of input-output transformations, what's the mm -hmm. observable input, what's the observable output, we, okay. will, we will do a better job of describing mm -hmm. the functionality and we'll end up with verifiable requirements. Otherwise, right. we'll end up with non-verifiable requirements, like the system shall validate the user within five mm -hmm. seconds. What does that mean? Right, right. It, means, okay. it could mean anything, mm -hmm. in which case we're leaving it up to the designers to design the system for us. Well, I don't leave it up to the designers to design the system because I'm the system designer. Right. So I'm going to do the trades to determine what's the best set of input and output interfaces. Mm -hmm. at the system of interest level. Then I'll do some trades about the next lower level architecture, mm -hmm. to figure out what the elements should be. Am I going to actually have a retinal scanner or a card reader or whatever? Mm -hmm. How am I going to interact with the bank? To me, mm -hmm. those are my responsibilities as a system designer. I once had a software person say, well, I wouldn't have designed it that way. And I said, that's okay, but I'm the system designer and this is the way <laughs> I designed it. And I'm right. not going to tell you how to design your software as long as right. it meets its requirements. Exactly. So right. it's important okay. to recognize that design is a creative activity and there's no single possible solution. Right. And the reason we do trial architectures is so we can examine possibilities and come up with something that is at least better than other possibilities. So when someone says, well, why did you choose that? Because I don't mm -hmm. like it. You have right. a rationale for why you chose it, and it can explain right. why it was better than something else. Okay. That makes sense. Great. I really appreciate your thoughts on this, Dr. Carson. I'll be thinking about this, and, and I, I really hope that the outcome from this discussion is that uh, everyone could understand that there are, in fact, two types of functional decomposition, those that are observable at that high-level system of interest boundary, and those that are not and those are the ones that you need to decompose that logical architecture prior to then discovering what those lower level functions are so to me that makes a lot of sense and i really appreciate your thoughts and input on this today ron good to talk with you brian thanks for your attention and good questions absolutely, absolutely. all right uh until next time we look forward to seeing you more on linkedin okay